Okay. And we have a little bit of a special treat today. Um, we are going to be reading chapter two and chapter three. Chapter two is a review. And Levi has been studying the from memorization chapter two verses one through 20 all 20 verses and the the bible the bible that they use at their school is a little bit more catered towards the kids as far as um you know being able to remember some of the words so i am going to let levi take the floor in a second here okay and go ahead right here bud Okay, and we pay attention. All right, you guys ready? Yep. All right, Levi. Go ahead. Start it off the way that you said. And it came. No, no, start it off in the beginning. Luke two one through twenty. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And Joseph also went up to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, and Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that thou, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And lo, the angel of and there, and there were in, in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Which shall be to all people. For unto, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be sign unto you. You ye shall, shall find the babe wrapped in swollen clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, suddenly there was. In the, and suddenly and there, there was, was with, with the, the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and singing glory we to God in the highest and, and on earth peace with world towards men. Yes. And they came and with haste and found Mary and Joseph. And the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they, they made known abroad the same which was told them concerning the child. And all Though they that heard it wondered at those, those things, things which were told, told them by the shepherd. Correct. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And, and the shepherds, shepherds returned, glorifying and, and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. And, and was told was them. Told unto them. All right, buddy. Good yeah. job, yeah. handsome boy. Right there. Give me some high fives. So proud of you. <laughs> so proud of you. All right. We're going to finish off the chapter, bud, if you want to stay. So. Wow. Taking Did off. You know from that was in process? Yes. Wow. So moving on from verse 20. Uh, 21. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child... His name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, 
as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout. What we lost, Tia? Yeah, they fell off before he finished. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took them up in his he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company. They went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being the tetrarch of Galilee, uh, Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Itria in the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain, shall, mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to rise up children of Abraham from these stones. And even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, 
what shall we do then? And he answered and said unto them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came up to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? Okay. I want you to distract everybody else. Okay. Do you want to take a seat? Or do you want to, do you want to go downstairs? Okay. You need to go downstairs, bud. If that's what you want to do. All right. Go. Okay. Where were we? Top of, top of page nine sixty one. And he said to them, collect no and, and he more. said to them, collect no more than that what is appointed to you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, and what shall we do? So he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. Now, as the people were in expectation, and all reason in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff, he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. But Herod, the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this, Above all, that he shut John up in prison. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son, and in you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janna, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathiah, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Elsley, the son of Nagai, the son of Maath, the son of Mattathiah, the son of Simei, the son of Joseph, the son of Judah, the son of Jonas, the son of Reheza, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shethael, the son of Neri, the son of... Okay. Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kosam, the son of Elmodam, the son of Ur, the son of Jose, the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonan, the son of Elican, the son of Melia, the son of Menam, the son of Madapath, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Amminadab, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sarag, the son of Reu, son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Kenan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lemek, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Melhalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. <laughs> wow. Amen. Amen. Bam. Well done. <laughs> My gosh. Needed to take a breather. <laughs> okay. Let's get into it. How many people read chapter three aside from right now? Good. Okay. So got through the first part, which was our little stud here in which who I am well pleased. I bet. Uh, yeah, and that's why I, I love I love pertaining scripture to my personal life when I see this kind of stuff with my kids, and yeah. I see that I just see it kind of shows the character of God. That's a lot for him to memorize. It's phenomenal. He's, it's, and I I love it. It's brilliant. Incredible. Amazing. Okay. So little little brief recap on chapter two since we reread it. Okay. We talked about what the manger is perceived as based on what we've seen in storefronts and in every Christmas story the, that has been westernized. We learned that it was probably something more along these lines 
uh, hewn out of stone. And it was definitely foreshadowing of the significance of in which that's how he was brought into this world and that's how he's um, taken out essentially. We talked about his humble, humble beginnings, right? He was conceived in Nazareth. We learned that Nazareth is like the lowest of the low, born in a cave out, or a stable that's outside. He wasn't born into this royal type of a, a situation. We don't see a midwife. We see it's just Joseph and Mary. Uh, he's laid in a feeding trough. He's not announced to the palace guard. He's announced to shepherds by angels. But when he's, And when he's brought to the temple, he doesn't get a lamb as a sacrifice. He gets the turtle doves. And we asked ourselves, well, but why? Okay. And this verse really sums it up. I know there were three that we had last week, but this is the one that really takes it home to me is Philippians 2, 6 through 8, who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as men, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of cross, death of the cross. Who was that death on the cross for? That's right. We talked about last week, 44 prophecies that uh, Christ fulfilled that needed to be fulfilled. Uh, this was 24 of the 44. From, from what I remember, I think there's closer to 50. But again, this was directly out a, a scripture fulfilled out of Micah, speaking directly of where Christ would need to be born. And that was in Bethlehem which really gave us a clear insight on who is in charge of what, even though Caesar Augustus had made this decree, we know the reality of the situation is, is that's what God needed to do in order for his word to remain true. We talked about the timeline of Jesus, and we talked about how there's, it's not that there's discrepancies between the books, it's the, the accounts are recorded in different manners such as luke is looking at christ's humanity him being a man luke being a doctor he's documenting the items that led to his humanity in a first-hand account he's addressing the items that again speak to his humanity so chapter 3 15th year of the reign tiberius caesar pontius pilate being governor of judea herod being the tetrarch of galilee his brother philip tetrarch and the, uh, the Iturea in the region of Trachonitis and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. So we're, the details that I have on here, they're not going to be super in-depth uh, because we have covered a, a lot of these Roman officials during our previous studies in the Gospels. So I'm not going to say refer back to those. I'm going to give you real brief what I have here. But when we get more into the trial that Christ was subject to, we're going to learn a little bit more about those individuals. So this is just going to be a brief overview, almost in similar fashion, the way that Luke does it. He gives you a breakdown of who's there. So Tiberius Caesar uh, is also known as Tiberius Caesar Augustus or Tiberius Claudius Nero, born November 16th, died March 16th. We know a few details about Pilate as a Roman governor of Judea. As governor, Pilate would have had previous military and administrative experience. Governors represented Roman rule and interests in their province, intense alliance with local leaders, exercising great power for the benefit of Rome. Pilate was recalled to Rome in early 37 after Christ, charging, being charged with misgovering, but the emperor, Tiberius, uh, I actually jumped into Pilate. I, I mingled those two together. My apologies. So we see that the way that I look at it is the best way that I could understand it is we see Tiberius Caesar. We're going to call that the president. Pontius Pilate, we're going to call him the governor, right? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll call him like we'd have to call him the governor in this scenario. So Pontius Pilate, everybody remembers Pontius Pilate for one reason. Uh, Miguel, why do you know Pontius Pilate's name? Well, he washed his hands and he didn't have anything. He didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus' death. He was the individual who was in charge while Jesus' death had, was going to trial. Yes. And he wanted to wash his hands of it. But the fact that he did not, we'll get into that when we get there. <clears throat> so 
Uh, he was in central Italy. Pontius Pilate served as the, the prefect of Judea from 26 to 36, convicted Jesus of truth, declared that Jesus thought himself to be king of the Jews and had Jesus crucified. Pilate died 39 AD. There's a lot of conjecture about how he died. People say that he committed suicide after this event, um, but there's, there's nothing that's, um, it's, I, I don't even want to say tangible, but there's, there's no part. Yeah, there's no credible evidence. There you go. That's the right word that I was looking for. So then that brings us over to Herod. What was your last sentence on that? What do you mean? An artifact, an artifact found, found in, in 19, Okay. Confirmed of his existence. Huh. Right. Because remember, there's a lot of people that have are act that take an active approach to, to just disproving disproving the Bible. If you remember in chapter one, we said that, hey, there was this, this individual he couldn't have served during that time because we know he was ruler during this time. And then archaeologists found out that he served a double term and it wasn't recorded by Josephus. So again, this was, I try and throw those, those types of things in. This one happened to be under this uh, Britannica was the one who gave this, a secular website gave that information. And, and you called him more like the governor and Augustus Caesar was more like you said. The president. President. So you would have the king and then you would have, let's call him the vice president for all intents and purposes. And then you have, these were the people who were leaders in that area. We talked about Herod being, we, we remember Herod the Great. Herod ruled all this. He was the one that was kind of a psycho. And so Herod was the family name that was established to this area. And if you recall, Tetrarch means a fourth, right? One fourth. So the, his, if you look on this map here, you can see where this area had been split up. So Judea was under Roman procurator. Why was it under the Roman procur procurator? And I'll slide. Oh, no, go back. Let me slide these. This is in my way. I'm going to minimize that. Perfect. Okay. So, um. After Herod the Great had died, his kingdom was divided among his three sons, Antipas, Philip, and Archelaus. Archelaus inherited Judea. Antipas was given Galilee and Perea, which is that Transjordan area right there. And Philip inherited the predominantly Gentile areas east and north of the Sea of Galilee. Caesar Augustus quickly removed Archelaus after there were so many bad reports about him from the Jews. So he lost his right to overseeing that land and a procurator was put in that place which we know as Pontius Pilate okay and this is something that came from uh, biblehistory.com it gives you a little bit more information about this particular Herod Herod Antipas the one that we'll talk about more because it involves it's more directly involved of the the, the trial and the time of Christ specifically, especially in the areas in which Christ traveled. We know that he was in Judea, Jerusalem, Bethlehem. We can see here and you can go all the way up. You can see Nazareth. We see the river Jordan, which on the map, you see the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea are linked by the Jordan River, essentially. That's that space in between. The Jordan River is where John the Baptist was baptizing. So you can kind of see how these areas will tie in. And I actually have something that I'd like to challenge you guys with after I can't prove it, but it's very, it, it just was very interesting to me as I was gathering information for this. So we talk about Herod, John the Baptist saw what Herod was doing, called out some of the issues. And that's where Herod, we see this last part right here, Herod Antipater, nicknamed Antipas, was the Tetrarch of, Gal Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea upon the death of his father, Herod the Great. As a tetrarch, is a ruler of one quarter as he receives one fourth of his father's kingdom. Herod Antipas ruled as a Roman client and was responsible for building projects, including capital city of Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee. Herod Antipas is the Herod mentioned most often in the New Testament, with the exception of Herod the Great mentioned in Matthew 1, Luke 1, and 2. Every mention of Herod in the Gospels refers to this Herod. Herod Antipas divorced his first wife, to marry Herodias, who had been the wife of his half-brother, Philip, the Tetrarch. And according to Josephus, the two fell in love and made plans to get married while Antipas was visiting his brother, Philip. John the Baptist begins his ministry during the reign of Philip and Antipas. 
And in the course of his fiery preaching and denunciation of sin, he rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things that he had done. So it's kind of tying that thing in together. Now, the high priest was uh, an office in which was held in really high accord, and you don't have any other instances where you see two. So this is very unique why there were two high priests during this time. And during the trial of Christ in Matthew, and I believe we'll see it in Luke, there's mention of both these individuals. And um, the, what's his name? Don Stewart, who's like a big prophecy buff, had a great little notation about uh, these two individuals. And he shows Annas had been high priest from 6 AD to 15. So that should be 15, you yeah, know, 6 to 15 AD. The Romans had removed him from office, yet he still wielded considerable power behind the scenes. Five of his sons succeeded him as priests. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest who was in office during the time of Jesus's ministry. Okay, so we have an instance here where you have the older who the people still look to, but was removed by the Romans. So the people who are Jewish are looking to their high priest, but the Jews appointed someone else, which happens to be a relative of him, right? Father-in-law. And so the Jews would go to Caiaphas, and then we would see that it would be a recommendation to Annas. And, and that's where these two tie in. Even though there isn't, there is only one high priest, Luke actually records it the most accurately in the way that he did. So the next thing, the uh, verse three, we got through the first two verses. <laughs> verse three, John, we, you guys, we know John and we're jumping right into. So if you guys recall, there was, there was in the other gospels, there's more of a record or a record, more of a record of um, really the, the life leading up to these events. Luke's hammering down the facts, right? So we immediately see John and Jesus at the entrance into their ministry. John, and right here in verse three, and he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And how did he do that? I mean, there is just so, so much material specifically on John because there are so many pastors who will choose a route of um, prancing around the subject to try and kind of get you in because of the, the safety of the culture and trying to break it in softly. And how do we see that John uh, addresses the individuals who are coming to listen to what he has to say? John calls them a brood of vipers, <laughs> right? So, we're going to get an intro to the introduction to John right now in verses four through six. And he introduces himself as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth. Okay. He's referring to something that Isaiah said. And if we went over to Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 through one through 5. This is what the scripture is. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says, the, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight a desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Okay. Isaiah, I'm sorry. John is referring to himself as a fulfillment of this scripture spoken of in Isaiah. There's multiple There's, I would say, I don't even, I don't even think you could say that there is multiple here. So the, the interpretations that go along with this is when someone was a king 
and they were of royalty, there would be a commoner that would go out in front of the king and would have all the people prepare the land as his horse and chariot were carrying him through the town that prior to him entering that city or that town, they would remove the pathway of all rocks, twigs, trees, debris, or anything. So his path would be straight and wouldn't stumble, trip, or anything along those lines. There's a guy by the name of Spurgeon who was a phenomenal pastor. And his interpretation is as such, and I've recorded it here to share with you guys. This is something that's been summarized by another pastor who's still alive now. He's in our generation. He's, a, he's an Irish guy named Alistair McBeg. And here's what Spurgeon had to say. The voice, of, the voice crying in the wilderness demanded a way for the Lord, a way prepared, and a way prepared in the wilderness. It would be attentive to the master's proclamation and give him a road into my heart cast upon by gracious operations through the desert of my nature. The four directions in the text must have my serious attention. Every valley must be exalted. Low and groveling thoughts of God must be given up. Doubting and despairing must be removed, and self-seeking and carnal delights must be forsaken. Across these deep valleys, a glorious causeway of grace must be raised. Every mountain and hill shall be laid low. Proud creature sufficiency and boastful self-righteousness must be leveled to make a highway for the king of kings. Divine fellowship is never promised to haughty, high-minded sinners. The Lord has respect to the lowly and visits the contrite in heart, but the lofty are an abomination to him. My soul, beseech the Holy Spirit to set you right in this respect. The crooked shall be made straight. The wavering heart must have a straight path of decision for God and holiness marked out for it. Double-minded men are strangers to God, are strangers to the God of truth. My soul, take heed that in everything you are honest and true, as in the sight of the heart-searching God. So, Spurgeon's take on this particular scripture is a self-evaluation of us of who do you think you are? This is the king of kings that's coming, you know, and, and we see how did the how did the king of kings come to us? We're going to learn that he came lowly riding upon a donkey, he didn't come on some majestic horse or anything like that. And that only fits further into the humble route that he chose for us. <clears throat> verses 7 through 10 this is john the baptist speaking then he said unto the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves we have abraham as our father okay I got a picture of a brood of vipers here just so nasty when you see it so this is from the, one of the Bible study sites that I use for references. John the Baptist condemned the, Pharise condemned the Pharisees and Sadducees as a brood of vipers in Matthew 3, 7. A brood of vipers is a family of snakes because of vipers. Because vipers are venomous, John was essentially calling the religious leaders deadly sons of serpents. It's quite a bold denunciation. And one Jesus repeated to the Pharisees in Matthew. The Pharisees and Sadducees were religious leaders in Israel during the time of John the Baptist and Jesus. The Pharisees were the law keepers and promoters of tradition. And the Sadducees comprised the wealthier ruling class. Over the centuries, these well-meaning groups had become corrupt, legalistic, and hypocritical. And would eventually be responsible for the crucifying or for crucifying the Son of God. They earned their label, brood of vipers. <sighs> what else? The viper was seen to be an evil creature. Its venom was deadly, and it was also devious. The viper that bit Paul was hiding in the firewood. The Hebrew scriptures, which the Pharisees knew well, associated the serpent with Satan in Genesis 3. For John to call the Pharisees a brood of vipers implies that they bore satanic qualities. This idea is clearly stated by Jesus in John 8, 44, where he says to the unbelieving Jew, belong that the unbelieving jews belong to their father the devil 
we went over that verse when we were in John specifically, because the Pharisees at that time, it wasn't that they were questioning fatherhood there. They were calling Christ a bastard because they said they knew his genealogy. They referred to their boast that they were of Abraham. Um, so rightfully so, they're called brood of vipers. The next section here that I highlighted in this, in this little portion was, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. Okay. What do you guys think that that statement means? Shelly, what do you think that means? I, I have all the, the screens minimized, so I can't tell. If my, my mom and dad's power went out, so they, she's on speakerphone on my phone. Oh, okay. What, sorry, babe. What was your question? I'll ask you then, Michelle. What do you think the highlighted verse means? where it says, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And don't worry about the last part, but what do you think it means, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance? Mm, I don't know. Okay, so when you have a tree that's growing, what does it do? When you have a tree that's growing? Right, like, what do you, like an, it, apple, an apple tree. It's, it's going to... Something's worth saving? Right. It's going to be productive. So you'll have a tree that's producing a fruit and you, and that is what it's goal. You have a peach tree that's not producing any peaches. You're going to chop it down. Right. So he says, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. So if you've repented of something, it should be evidenced in your life that you've turned away from it. Right. So the problem being addressed. Okay. I wrote, if you have repented of something, there should be evidence, items that will be referenced shortly. The problem being addressed is the visitors who hear the message and are contemplating that they are basically good people. They go to church. They are born into a family of religious followers and have an active membership. The next part of that that I write is, the clout of your father will not save you. It doesn't matter that my dad was a Christian. I don't just get to inherit his belief. And for many of you know, my dad was an atheist and it wasn't until much later on in life that he confessed Jesus Christ as his Lord and savior. And it, it was, it was great. It, it was great when that happened. Um, but it's what, what's being said right here in that whole statement. The reason why I highlighted the whole thing is, is therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I'm a Jew. Doesn't matter what you're here for, because my father is Abraham. Remember the Abraham covenant? I'm circumcised. I've got this. You know what I'm saying? He's calling them out. That that's it's. You can't just fall back on the fact that that's where your dad is. You can't fall back on the fact that you have a church membership or you do all these things. It's nice. That's cool. But it's a judgment of the heart. There's nothing that you're repenting of that means that you're perfect, right? And we know that we're not perfect. So. He's talking about, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. As he goes on in this verse, for I say unto you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Okay? Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Why would the axe be laid to the root of the tree? Because it's not producing any fruit. Therefore, Every tree which does not bear good fruit is what? Is cut down and thrown into the fire. So thousands of people are going out to see John. He's out in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness. They're hearing the message that he's saying. They're going to do exactly what you or I would do. They're going to do some reflecting and say, he's right. I've made some errors. What do I need to do? And that's exactly what the people say. So the people asked him saying, what do we do? <laughs> what do we do? We, we, we don't want to be chopped down and burned. We know what that means. We know what you're saying. Don't call us sons of Satan. What do we got to do? And so he jumps right into the, the next portion and says, and he answered and said unto them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. 
And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then the tax collectors, this is another group of people, tax collectors came to him and said, came to him to be baptized and said unto him, teacher, what do we do? We're tax collectors. And he said unto them, collect no more than what is appointed for you. Now we have a different group of people, a different type of culture. Soldiers came to him and saying, what do we do? And he said, don't intimidate anyone or accuse them falsely. And then be content with your wages. Okay. Put some of my notes down here. I think it was Sproul who made the comment to note what was said to the tax collectors. He didn't send them to the capital, capital to dispute the taxation. He told them not to steal from their brother. As the taxpayers were able, under the authority of the Romans, to take whatever they could, get off the... Okay. So essentially, the taxpayers of that time were appointed a certain dollar amount that they needed to get from the people. However, it was permitted for them, even though it was a paid position, that if they could extract more money out of those individuals off the top, then they were able to keep it. They were stealing from their brethren. John's telling them, hey, I know that this is what the government's asked you to do. Don't steal. That's it. Don't go. He's not telling them, go, go to the government. This law is BS. He's not saying that. He's saying only do what they're asking of you and don't steal from your brother. It's not right. The other thing, I mean, okay, moving on. And I even, I even put a, cell, a note in here for myself. <laughs> don't talk about politics on this standpoint. I can save it for another discussion. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to break it down and I call this the Elliot version. And, and hopefully you guys can see it this way. If not, I can, we can try another way. But as we're reading this, we're told to help those that are in need. Okay. You see a guy outside and he doesn't have clothes on. He's naked, freezing his butt off in the rain right now. Give him, give him your jacket. I know everyone in this room wouldn't have a problem doing that. That's great. You see someone who's hungry. You know what I mean? We see him with the signs all the time. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm homeless, this, 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 and that. I, None of us would have a problem buying a meal for that person. That's easy to do. Check the box. Okay. Don't steal. There, there's a lot of things that are meant by not stealing. And there are some individuals that brought up some really good points, but I'm not going to do that right now. And don't intimidate. You're not supposed to muscle someone into a decision or be condescending to them. And lastly, be content with your wages. And that's basically when humility is issued right? You're unhappy with your salary, so on and so forth. You're supposed to be content with your wages. That's a tough one. Okay. Now, 15 through 18. As the people were in expectation and all reason in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John makes it clear to them, I indeed baptize you with water, the one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. Going into this, the first part of that verse or the first part of this section says what? Now, as these people were in expectation, what were they in expectation for? Do you guys recall from the other studies in the Gospels? Okay, so the people were in expectation of the Christ, the Messiah. They knew he was coming. It was about the time that he should present himself. And John establishes that he's not the Christ that he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, like what Isaiah is saying. And he's letting them know that the other one who's coming after him, he's not even worthy to loosen his sandal strap. So he's letting him know he's not the Christ. But it tells you about the, per the persons that were there because they're asking the question. Or, or it shows here that they were in expectation and reasoning in their hearts whether or not he was the Christ, Okay. So we talked about the threshing floor before. We just talked about a tree that's not bearing any fruit is not worth anything, right? So do you guys remember this particular, um, actually, I don't know if this was the exact picture that I used, but here we see that they had chopped down the wheat 
right? And then the wheat would be laid down on this area called the threshing floor. They would have a big piece of wood. Is this place? Oh, that's why. Okay, can you guys see my laser pointer now? Yes. So we have the wheat in the background. They would chop it down. They would bind it into sheaths. They would bring it over here into this section. They would have the cows with this big piece of wood they would stand on and they would, they would go around in circles and crush the wheat. And out of the crushing of the wheat, the seed would be exposed. And then what they would do here is throw the wheat in the air and the, the, the chaff would be separated from the wheat, the seed of what was valuable, right? And so we see over here, the last part, we have this winnowing fan. These individuals here are gathering the seed and throwing it up in the air and they're fanning or in areas where there was a threshing floor, they normally did it on the top of a hill where there would be a long breeze, essentially. And um, whatchamacallit, the wheat would be left behind. So I have, I have something for you guys today. I want to get rid of the laser pointer. Oh no, I don't know how to turn it off. Okay. Okay. I don't know why that won't let me do that. So we're gonna, I'm gonna show you this because I want to. And we're gonna go on here and do control click. It's a five minute video and I'm gonna skip through a couple parts. Can you guys, oh, you guys can't see the video, can you? No. Okay, you will now, hold on. Do you see the wheat? Yes. Okay. Are you seeing how he's binded into stocks? Mm -hmm. I just, are you guys able to, is the video playing? Yes. I, I don't okay. know if you got, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, I can see it. Okay. So essentially this is just an advanced version of what they were doing then, but this machine right here, it is like a pulverizer. It just mashes out the heads of the, the grain of wheat and we'll see what's left behind. So this would be the heads of the wheat, right? You have it in a bucket. This is where we saw that those individuals were, were gathering and throwing up the large sticks in the air. So this guy's gonna shake it through and sift this stuff. That was a fanning, right? Yes. So now this is the next screen that's a little bit finer. Okay, and this is the cool part, okay? So now it's the part to the winnowing fan. This guy does this in slow motion to give you an idea. Do you know what a combine is? Yes. I used to drive those things doing that. <laughs> it's cool though, huh? I mean, it is. I, I, I'm, all, the only thing that I want to bring up out of this is out, out of the last 8,000 years that they've been doing this, the only thing that we've improved on is the technology to do with the task that was already the same process that we had before. You know what I mean? What I mean by that is, is production. We have, we have more of this stuff happening. We can do it in a shorter amount of time, but it's the same process essentially. And you can see in this last pour, only the grain is there and all of the other stuff is out. So he's gonna show you at the very end here, this is pure wheat. It's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. So what is all the other stuff good for? Let's go back to the beginning of the video. Is it still show you the video here or no? Yes. Yeah. You see all the sheaves and all the stuff that's here? What is all that other material good for? Nothing. Nothing. It's going to be tossed in the fire. 
And that's, that's the analogy that's given here. So let's go back to, oh no, not from the beginning. Oh. What? Sorry guys, I'm having some technical difficulties over here. There we go. All right. So here's the less technologically advanced version of it, but probably more effective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they get a lot more done that way. So <clears throat> that gets us into the 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 winnowing fan, right? And we see that what was Christ's role? His he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But what will happen to everyone else? But the chaff, he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, I wonder if I included this. Okay, I didn't include this. So one of the things that I wanted to share with you guys is that oftentimes when a field would burn and they were burning the chaff, this is kind of cool, the serpents would be pushed out from the heat, but the fire would burn so quickly that it would normally burn up these snakes that were inside the field and they would be killed consequently of burning the chaff. So the, they would burn the chaff also, they wouldn't just leave it behind because it, was, it, it drew in rodents and they didn't want any rodents near the wheat. So that kind of gives you an analogy about all these things that are outside. The way that, I love the way that Christ and the Holy Spirit guide the text so that way the application mattered specifically to that time during that time period. And it still applies to us some 8,000 years later because we can see the same process and you can put the analogy together on what he's referring to about those who have faith and are saved by grace and those who are trying to believe another gospel that's associated to works. And, and we can expand upon that, but we won't. So 19 through 22. Herod the Tetrarch being rebuked by him concerning Herodias and his brother, Philip's wife, for all the evils that he had done. We've already talked about that. Um, I wanted to tell you guys this that I thought was pretty cool. We know from the other we know from the other gospels the details surrounding John's imprisonment. We talked about that a little bit prior to with that one slide. This is a good example of not conforming the word of God to the world. Okay. Our Bible has stood the test of time, and we are specifically instructed not to change it. Remember Paul. Oh, foolish Galatians. How quickly you have turned to another gospel, right? And then we could keep going on. This instance here, John called out the leader for the evil and was persecuted for it, okay? Okay. We're not supposed to have our culture change the content of scripture. The church should be changing the world, not conforming to it. I'm pleased that the last couple of times that I've been to church over here at Southwinds, that that is a message that our pastor is presenting because that it coincides with everything we're reading right now. Those things matter to me. That's why we're doing this kind of stuff. And when you guys go to church, you can ask those questions and you can stand on the Bible because you know it's true, not the other men. Think about who John was calling the brood of vipers. Those are the religious leaders. Can you imagine if all the pastors were having a convention and the Pope was there and this prophet comes out of the woodworks and calls him a brood of vipers, sons of Satan? People would be losing their mind. But he, he did it with scripture. And there needed to be repentance if those people were, in fact, errors in their ways, which we know that these individuals were from the scriptures that we're reading right now and from what Christ said. The other part of this here <clears throat> is baptism. So second part of the scripture is Jesus' baptism and how the spirit descended upon him like a dove and a voice spoke from heaven. You are my beloved son. In you, I'm well, well pleased. We know in the record of some of the other gospels that other individuals heard this and they mistook it for an earthquake. I, I just see this as the, a moment for the character of God. He's called our heavenly father. 
And there's something about when your kids do something great, you know what I mean? It's, it's like, I don't know how everyone else parented here. Cause I, 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 I know you guys through Michelle. I know everyone in this room here because of Michelle. But I could tell you that when my kids are at the soccer game or something like that, even if it's something minimal, I can't contain myself. It's, pro it's, it's a problem, I would say. I, I am excited about them. You know what I mean? And on any level, the motorcycles, whatever it may be, it's exciting to be proud of them. And I see here, to me, this is an example of the character of the God that created us, where <laughs> whatever expanse he yelled through in order for this message to be heard. Imagine being the person down there. Imagine being sitting there. You just got done baptized by John. All of a sudden Jesus comes through and everyone's like, Whoa, this is that guy that John's talking about. And now that the heavens open up, the Holy spirit descends on him as a dove. And now God, the father speaks. There's a voice, but nobody can see what it is. You are my beloved son and you, I'm well pleased. I think that's, that's really cool to me. Um, <clears throat> the last part of this is this genealogy, right? And it was a bit of a challenge to read through. I'm not going to lie. It's, it gets really hard, but you'll notice that there are differences between Luke's genealogy record and Matthew's genealogical record. And it's not that they're in error of each other is that for whatever reason, it appears that Luke chose to go through the bloodline of Mary. So we see Joseph and we see Mary. And then we don't see, because remember Christ is presented as a man, as the son. He's presented as the son of God. He's presented as God. And then he's presented as a slave, right? Or as a servant. Nobody keeps a record of a servant. You're not going to get a genealogy of a, out of a servant. And that's why one of the gospels doesn't keep a record of this. John, how does John introduce Jesus? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Speaking of his divinity. So in this instance here, it's almost as if in each area of the gospels, his genealogy has been categorized through these various things that needed to be met. And it's, it's the Holy spirit guiding this, right? So here we see all these names that go all the way back to Adam. And I just think that is so cool. You guys know Chuck Misler is like the geek when it comes to the names, right? And I tried to find if he had anything on all these names and I spent some sometime today categorizing these 77 names from Jesus to Adam, trying to come up with the various definitions of what these names meant. And there is a gap and I ran out of time. So it's a project that I'll continue to work on just to see if it, if it says anything. And the reason why I even say that is because Chuck Misler and his team noticed when they were categorizing the names as they appear in the Bible in Genesis chapter one, which was Seth, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Melhelel, Jared, Methuselah, Enoch, Lamech. That this is what we saw. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Melhelel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. Hidden message based on their names. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching his death shall bring the despairing comfort for rest. Okay. It's a hidden message tucked away in the genealogy of man in Genesis one, speaking of how God would have redemptive properties to man. Where man is appointed mortal sorrow. Where did the you blessed. That? What's that? Where did you find that? We would. <laughs> I, we brought this up when we did our Genesis study. We did, we went over this when we did revelation and uh, we did it in John. This was a Chuck Misler thing. Remember when we first started, everyone kind of had a hard time with Chuck Misler because he's so like. Uh, so that's what the, the name means, right? Correct. Adam means man. Right. Tusala is dead, shall bring. So correct. you put him on, I saw that before. So that's the, what, the meaning of its name. 
Correct. That's why they say names mean a, mean a lot in the Bible. So I'll give you a perfect example of how we can validate. Who is the oldest man ever to live? The oldest. The oldest man to ever live was Methuselah. He was 989 years old. What does his name mean? His death shall bring. The day that Methuselah died was the day that the floodwaters hit the earth. That was the end of the 120 days? The, well, I'm, I'm saying the day that he died was the day that the, the rain started. So we see an instance of God's mercy. They were given 989 years to repent. It was the longest time, the longest human life that we have on record of 989 years. That's how long he lived. And his name literally meant his death shall bring. So that, that name has meaning in its context directly applying to his time on this earth but separating his name and putting it in order as they appear in scripture this is what's being seen why was seth's name appointed because cain killed abel so seth was appointed as a replacement man is appointed mortal sorrow and seth, seth that's the uh, son of uh where uh, of adam were the lineage from Jesus. Well, all of them. Mm -hmm. These ones, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's just... So what's, what, what, what are the chances of that happening by chance? And that's what I'm saying. That's like Chuck Misler went into this whole study about the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit. He says, if you ever wanted to know what error correcting code has been put in place, you know, from the dawn of time to know when the scripture cannot be corrupted in such a way, so on and so forth. He says, you'll see the fingerprint of the Holy Spirit in sevens. He calls it the heptatic structure. And as he was going through these various studies and things of that sort, they started cataloging these names and they noticed that this is what was said there. Chuck Misler's team found this. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching his death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. It's a summary of the Christian gospel. So it's uh, it's pretty good. Oh, yeah, we're already, we're over our time. I was going to say, I'll show you guys the heptatic structure that's inside the book of Luke. And the first time you see it, it'll give you chills because it's, it's, it's so crazy. And um, like, I, I believe Chuck Misler, it's a fingerprint of the Holy Spirit. This is... The way that it's written, the way that the words are placed, the spaces in between the words, it creates the structure that you could not do it on your own, even if you tried, and you had the ability to write your own language. It's impossible. And he's all about numbers and statistics and things of that sort. And he takes it out like, oh, you know, this is uh, uh, one and six times 10 to the 870 trillion, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, and this is an infinitesimal such, you start reading it, you're like, okay, I know this guy knows what he's talking about. He's saying it's impossible. And this is the data that he has to support that. And then he just starts lining it out for you. It's, it's pretty awesome. So um, our homework will be to read chapters four and five. And um, I'm going to shut down the recording here so we can close out. Uh, no.